Father, as a family, there are seasons where we enjoy a great meal and when we have to suffer through great sorrow. And so as a church, we come before you for the church in in El Salvador, especially in Sunsal. We ask God that you would be Jehovah Jireh and provide for them. Lord, we pray that you would even use Calvary Chapel South Bay in some way to be able to support them and be able to raise that church up again from the ground. Thank you, Jesus, that no one was hurt. And now, Father, we pray for Calvary Chapel in Liberia. We ask, God, that you would be with the family of the one who is now with you. We pray that you would be with Othello as he navigates through and ministers to the family. We pray for the churches as they all wonder and ponder. And I pray that you'd give them wisdom and strength and courage in these days to stand for the gospel. And Father, I pray that they would know Calvary Chapel South Bay is with them. Lord, we now come before you and ask that you would give us a spiritual mind and ears and eyes and a heart so that we can grow as we study Scripture together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Gospel according to Mark. We know that he was a disciple of Peter. and So this Gospel most likely would represent Peter's heart. He's written a letter, a book, to let us know that we can all begin again because Mark was able to begin again after he messed up even in Christ. Mark has shown us the power of the Holy Spirit operating through John the Baptist and that John the Baptist would simply do what God had asked him to do and be a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Mark has also showed us that Jesus would be led by the same Spirit that filled John the Baptist, that the Spirit of God would lead Jesus into the wilderness to initiate a war between heaven and hell. Because Jesus had come to destroy the works of the devil, and that work is death. And by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he conquered death. And only Jesus is the one who can give the keys to eternal life. The Spirit has moved powerfully in the life of Jesus. We see it in his teaching already, in his miracles. Peter's mother-in-law was healed and and the healings that he did. But most importantly, we see it in the expression of his love. And very early in the book of Mark, he wants us to see the love of Jesus Christ expressed by the Spirit of God in him. Because without love, we're nothing. This paralytic was brought by his friends to Jesus because they knew that Jesus was the only answer for him. We would do well to follow these four faithful friends and bring our friends to Jesus because he is the only answer. When this man was lowered down, Pastor Jeff taught us that that Jesus, he, he knew what was in this man's heart and without a word, Jesus forgave him of his sins. That would not be all, to reveal that he has the power to forgive sins and the love for this man. He would say to this man, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Take a look, it's Mark chapter 2. Now we pick it up in verse 12. Mark chapter 2, verse 12, immediately he arose, took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all so that they were all, maybe you'll circle that word, They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. They were all amazed. This word is important, and I've asked you to circle or even underline it, because Mark is prepping us for the next subject. He is prepping us to introduce us to one man. You see, the news of Jesus has quickly spread to everyone in the region, including one particular man that we would never expect to come to Jesus. Now, you know this man. You know him as Matthew. Mark is going to introduce us to him as Levi. He is one of the 12 disciples. And he and Jesus 
are about to connect. And Mark is letting us know with this word all that even Matthew, or Levi as his name was at the time, he had heard about Jesus. Because Jesus had been working on this man for quite a while. Just like he did the Apostle Paul when he showed up and he said to him on the road to Damascus, how long will you kick against the goads? In other words, Saul, I've been trying to get your attention for a long time because Jesus has a responsibility in the world to seek and to save the lost. And he is working on your friend. He is working on your neighbor. He is working on the person that you're working with. So Jesus is going to meet him. And what Mark is going to do is give us a bird's eye view of a dinner party. Because going out to dinner with someone is a great way to get to know them. I loved being in Israel because I made great friends. I ate breakfast. I ate lunch. I ate dinner with a group of people that I now call friends. In fact, when I see them at church, my heart... Just, and, and when I was coming here to Ch Calvary Chapel, South Bay, I went out with one of the, uh, the board of directors, one of the board members, and I had dinner with him and his wife, my wife and I, and now we're friends there's something about going out to dinner with someone that Mark capitalizes on so that we can get to know Jesus just a little bit better. So let's get ready to go out to dinner with Jesus. Now, I promise if you have not had breakfast, you will be hungry by the end of this message. Mark chapter 2, as we join Jesus for dinner, Mark chapter 2, verse 13, then he went out again by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. Now, if you'll flip over a page to Mark chapter 1, just flip over a page to Mark chapter 1, Jesus had a purpose. And would you take a look at the purpose that he received in prayer? Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Jesus woke up early in the morning, and he found his purpose in prayer. I have a friend of mine. Every morning he wakes up at 4.30, long before the sun rises, and his prayer every morning is, Jesus, run me into people today that need to hear the gospel. Amen. That was the life of Jesus. He received his purpose in his early morning prayer, and he's fulfilling that purpose in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. He goes to another town around the Sea of Galilee to preach the kingdom of God has come. But not only that, Jesus has been healing. The paralytic man and his friends have gone out and told him what Jesus has done after they lowered him there in the midst of that crowd. And Jesus is using his popularity, he's using his position, not for himself, but to advance the kingdom of God into the lives of people, and we as well. Do you know that every single one of you have influence? Every single one of you have influence. You have influence over someone. How are you using that influence for the sake of the gospel? Mark chapter 2, pick it up with me in verse 14. As he passed by, you better know that this was not a coincidence. This is a god -o -ince. He's not just walking down the road because he just wanted to pass by this road. Oh, no, 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 no. He had a purpose as he passed by. He saw, another word you may want to underline, Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Levi. Levi. Now that should ring a bell if you've been a studier of the Bible for some time. Levi. His name indicates his tribe, and his tribe indicates his responsibility. He was of the tribe of Levi. So Matthew should have been a Levitical priest. Definitely not a tax collector. We know that he was well-educated because we see most of what we know about him we find in his book. He knew more of the Old Testament than any of the other gospel writers. His knowledge of the Old Testament is so extensive, he quotes the Old Testament more than any of the other gospel writers. His literary genius 
It rivals the well-educated Apostle Paul. Matthew was trained. And we see in his training the training for the potential of a Levitical priest. Well, what happened? Well, why didn't he follow his calling to be a Levitical priest? Well, most theologians believe that Matthew was so fed up with the corruption in Jerusalem that he figured, I'm not going to use religion to gain money like these priests here in Jerusalem. I'm just going to go and use the Romans to gain money, and I'm going to become a tax collector. Let me tell you about tax collectors. Tax collectors were corrupt. I wanted to connect them to the IRS, but I decided not to. Because <laughs> we pray for our government. And so, Lord Jesus, we... <laughs> In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist gives us an insight to the first century tax collector. Take a look at the screen. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And John the Baptist says to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. You see, they were always collecting more than what they were supposed to. One of the most famous tax collectors was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. You remember, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was... He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to. Great job. You guys grew up in my Sunday school. I'm not going to sing anymore. Some of you are like, okay, let's keep going. In Luke chapter 19, verse 8, listen to what Zacchaeus said after he spent time with Jesus. He said to the Lord, Lord look, Lord. I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've get, taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Zacchaeus was convicted with the amount of money he stole from the Jewish people. These tax collectors were hated by the Jews because they felt that they sold out to the Roman occupation, that they were using the Roman government to, for their own financial gain. Can you just imagine Simon Peter walking with Jesus and he looks at Levi, the tax collector, and Jesus says, you come follow me. You have to understand, Simon Peter would have paid taxes to Matthew. Matthew would have extorted Peter. And Jesus is walking by and says to Matthew, hey, why don't you come and follow us and be in our team? That would like you being best friends with the IRS auditor that is auditing you. It's just not real. This is Peter looking at Matthew. And can you imagine the first little steps they had together? Peter was probably saying, this man's a crook. He extorts money from the people of Israel. Peter probably had a different look at Levi. But Jesus doesn't see, this, see the same way that we see. And while Simon Peter saw someone who was an extorter, Jesus saw an evangelist. He saw an evangelist. He didn't happen to pass down this road. He purposed to pursue this man because Jesus was on a mission to seek and to save the lost. Remember, everyone had heard about what Jesus was doing, even Matthew the tax collector. And Matthew was pondering. Matthew was, uh, Jesus was preparing him. And Jesus knew that Levi had heard he knew that Levi was in wonder as to who was this Jesus from Nazareth. He knew that Levi was ready because Jesus knows a person's heart. We don't know a person's heart. All we know is that all we can trust is that Jesus has gone before us and he's preparing the person that you work with. He's preparing the person that you go to school with. He's doing the work of seeking and saving the lost. Are you doing the work of saying, come, follow Jesus? Now listen. The wonderful thing about Jesus is while Peter saw a tax collector, the love of Jesus covers over a multitude of sins because Jesus believes that the power of the Spirit can change us. 
You see, Jesus, Jesus saw a man that would no longer detest the Jews and extort them. He saw a man who would do everything in his power to win them over for the gospel. For not only would he write a book to the Jews that Jesus is the king of kings, he is your Messiah. He would go so far as Egypt and he would want to minister to the Jews there to tell them about Jesus. He would even go so far to Ethiopia and he would minister the truth that Jesus is the king of kings. And there in Ethiopia... He would even give up his own life as the Ethiopian king speared him to death for the sake of the gospel. This is why Jesus would change his name. And he would go from Levi, who was supposed to be a Levitical priest, to Matthew, which means the gift of God. You see, Matthew would tell his people about the gift of God that's found in Christ Jesus. This name was not a representation that Matthew was the gift of God. No, this was a representation that Matthew would communicate about the gift of God found in Jesus Christ. Because Matthew never forgot where he came from. In Matthew chapter 10, when Matthew is listing the 12 disciples, do you know what Matthew says about himself? Matthew, the tax collector. He never forgot where he came from so that he could always reach the world around him. Thank God Jesus sees beyond where we're at. Thank God that he sees not an extorter, but he saw an evangelist. Because had he had seen the way that Simon Peter was looking at him, oh, you don't want this guy at your back, Jesus. Maybe we never would have had the Sermon on the Mount in detail that's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Maybe we never would have known about the centurion who came to Jesus with so much faith. Maybe we would never have known the stories that Matthew is so careful to detail to us to show us the fulfillment of the Old Testament found in Jesus Christ. Matthew only had one decision to make. And that was to follow him. Take a look, if you would, at verse 14 again. He says, follow me. That was the call on Levi's life, but it's also the call on each of our lives. You see, Jesus, he shows us the product of what it means to follow him. And what I'd like to do is take a little litmus test right now and show you the four things that Jesus communicates on what it means to follow him. You'll take a look on the screen with me. It's the first one is going to be found in Luke chapter 9, verse 22 and, uh, 23 and 24. You can look it up later. Each one of these are a Bible study in and of themselves. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, he must pick up his cross and deny himself daily and follow me. You see, if you're going to choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're going to be, choose to be sacrificial. That's just what a follower of Jesus looks like. Someone who's willing to sacrifice their time, their treasure, and their talent. Secondly, Jesus, when he's communicating about what it means to follow, in John chapter 13, verse 35, John 13, 35, he says this, by all meant this, men, people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. You see, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're going to have love about you. You're actually going to be loving. I need to tell you something profound about love. Love is actually loving. It's actually loving. Now, we walk around and we say hello to everybody. How do you say hello? Hi. <laughs> Stranger danger. <laughs> do you remember Stranger danger? Or do you walk up to someone? Hey, brother! And they're like, ah! Let me tell you something. When they get in their car, you know, the, the only thing they think about, man, that guy hugged me. You see, love is actually loving, and the followers of Jesus are loving. We're not angry. We're loving. Followers of Jesus, he tells us in John chapter 15, verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You see, followers of Jesus are fruitful. 
They're always fruitful. They're bearing fruit every year. It's not just they bore fruit one year and they're no longer bearing fruit. They're bearing fruit all the time. They're bearing fruit in good seasons, bearing fruit in bad seasons. They're always bearing fruit. They're always about the work of the ministry. That's a follower of Jesus. But Jesus also says this about a follower of Jesus. It's number four. He says in John 8, 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, I know every one of you sitting in front of me or listening online, you can check this one off. Abide in the word means to learn it and to live it. To learn it and to live it. Now, the beauty of these words and these four things that Jesus communicates is he just doesn't teach them to us. He doesn't stand behind a lectern and say to us, okay, four things about being a disciple. You need to do this, 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 and then you don't see him ever again. That would be like me saying, hey, God bless you guys, and not walking out into the lobby and hugging you and, sh and shaking your hand, praying with you and crying with you. I'm going to write a book because I'm going to let you know, all pastors, it's a miracle we're not schizophrenic. <laughs> and I'm going to write the book, and the book's name is The Lobby. I go from, no, I'm not kidding. I go from, we're pregnant, to, my mom just died. I'm like, I go from, yes, amen, to, let me cry with you. And it's like emotion to emotion to emotion. I'm telling you, I'm writing a book. It's called The Lobby. How to Prevent Schizophrenia. And so what Mark is going to do so that we can see intimately the life of Jesus be a disciple, he's going to take us out to dinner. That's exactly what Mark does. He knows the best way to get to know someone is to see them in dinner. And he's going to give us this bird's eye view of a dinner party with Jesus so that we can see his way, his truth, and his life. Let's take a look. It's Mark chapter 2. Now verse 15. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors <gasps> and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Matthew accepts the call to follow Jesus. But I need to let you know something about Matthew. He still doesn't dress right. Because, you know, Christians have a way we look. You know? <laughs> She's not a great Christian. Look what she's wearing. <laughs> At least she came to church. Amen. Well, I mean, he's got shorts on. <laughs> Obviously, he knows at Calvary South Bay we don't wear shorts. I'm going to surprise you one Sunday. You know what the Bible says about Matthew? In Luke chapter 5, verse 28, the Bible says about Matthew, he left all. He left everything of his career. He knew he would not be able to come back. He rose up and he followed Jesus. There's no turning back for Matthew. He was ready to go. The question is, are you? Are you ready to leave it all and follow Jesus and take a look at the litmus test of your following and see where you're at. Matthew, this was not misery for him. He was so excited about his change of life, he throws a huge dinner party for all of his friends and he wants all of his friends to meet Jesus. And there's no better way to know someone than to take them out for dinner. Now I want you to imagine the mix in the crowd, okay? You got Simon Peter, <laughs> I've been following Jesus for about three months now. I know everything there is to know about Jesus, okay? Just want you to know that. You got Simon Peter. You got James and John, the son of thunder. And they're sitting down next to sinners and tax collectors. You got a full-on mix, okay? Now, you got to imagine this scene if you would just for a moment. You've got the sinners and the tax collectors, and you've got the people that were following Jesus already. I pray this scene exists at Calvary Chapel South Bay every single Sunday morning. 
I pray that your friends who don't know the Lord feel just as comfortable here as you do. Now, they will feel uncomfortable when I start giving them the gospel. Trust me. That's when you start seeing them like do like this, like they got indigestion because the Spirit of God is working on them. That's when you begin to see sweat. I met with someone a couple weeks ago, and while I was meeting with them, they began to sweat. And I said, I want you to know you're not out of shape. That's the Spirit of God. Like, he is moving. Dude, he goes, I'm going to have to change my shirt. He was like this. He goes, I don't know if I can take this. I go, hop on for the ride and strap your seatbelt on because your life's about to change. You see, I pray that the sinners feel comfortable to come to church because we love them so much. Because what Jesus will do is take them from where they are at to where he wants them to be if we will be an agent to bring them. And so that they can come in contact with Jesus like Matthew wanted with his friends. Now, I wonder what Simon was thinking. I wonder what Simon, when a sinner sat down next to him, what he was thinking. I wonder what James, the son of thunder, thought when the junkie sat down next to him. Like, I wonder what was going through their mind. I'll give you the answer. The disciples were following Jesus. And Jesus had no problem between the balance of being in the world and not of it. He had no problem of being in the world and not of it. This is his prayer for us. In John chapter 17, he says, I'm not taking them out of the world. I'm leaving them here. They're just not of it. They're just not of it. You see, you're at your job because Jesus left you there. You're at your school because Jesus placed you there. You're in your neighborhood because it's your mission field. And when you are amongst the world, we can't live in the Calvary Chapel South Bay bubble. We can't live in the Christian world because Jesus has sent us out of this world to go into the world to preach the gospel. We only come into this to get recharged, refueled, and then go back out into the world. You see, church is like a gas station. You go run again on empty. By the end of the week, you come in, you fill up, and you get back out there. Now, we actually hope you run out of gas by Thursday so that you come back. (laughs) This party was quite a scene. This party was such a scene that the Pharisees and scribes hear about it. And they choose to stop by. Now, I live in San Pedro. Let me tell you about San Pedro, people. We love parties. Okay, let uh, let me tell you about my neighbors, okay? I know when they're having a party. Let me tell you why. You can hear it through the night, okay? You can, <laughs> you can hear it all night. You live in San Pedro. You can hear it all night long. I mean, there is no doubt as to whether a party is going on in San Pedro. And you should see how they have dressed up the streets for Halloween. I mean, I got skeletons everywhere. Andre and I are like dropping harvest cards everywhere. It's like, we're going to put a harvest card in that skeleton's hand. So here's the deal. They love to party. And there's something about a good party, right? You can hear it for blocks. So the Pharisees, they know that a party's going on on Matthew's house. Take a look, if you would, at verse 16. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him, verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats with and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus heard it. He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A little tricky, guys. They don't go to Jesus. They show up at the party, uninvited guests, but they fit in really well because they were sinners just like everybody else. They just didn't realize it. And they don't go to Jesus, they go to the disciples. 
They're sowing seeds of discord. How is it that he's here at this bar? What's he doing? Breaker of the law. Having a party. He's actually having fun. <laughs> he's laughing. He's sowing, they're sowing seeds of discord. And it's amazing the difference in what the Pharisees saw and what Jesus saw. The Pharisees saw sinners. Jesus saw savers. He saw people that needed to get saved. You see, the Pharisees saw a problem, but Jesus saw his patience. See, we're out for dinner with Jesus, and we begin to see the Savior that we follow. And the most important thing I want you to see about our Savior, he's a healing physician. He's a healing physician. Now, I need to let you know something, and I'm not going to tell you his name. But I have an incredible doctor at Kaiser. He even gave me his personal phone number. He got saved here at Calvary Chapel South Bay. God did an incredible work in his life. And last year, a year ago October, when I got back from Liberia... I was so sick, I thought I was going to die. No, for real, I was so sick. So I called him. I knew I was sick, so I called him. And when I called him, he goes, what are you calling me for? Do you realize what time it is? like 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm not even at Kaiser yet. No. <laughs> Can you imagine if he did do that? <laughs> Some of you are like, he did that to you? <laughs> He was kind. He was compassionate. He met me at the office. Now, he wore a mask to protect himself, because who knows what I brought back from Liberia. But he was doing everything he could to make me well. That's what doctors do. Now, sometimes we may not like the treatment, but we definitely like the cure. And so the doctor, he, he called all of his friends. I began to go see different doctors. He was doing everything he could because that's what doctors do. They meet with sick people. Now, they don't purpose to get sick themselves. That's why he wore the mask. Can I tell you about Jesus? He's a great doctor. And he wears even a greater shield, the Holy Spirit. He's not affected or infected with our sin. He's in the world and he's not of it because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you about Jesus. He always makes the perfect diagnosis. He calls sin, sin. Now, you may not like it, but his goal is not to leave you in it. His goal is to cure you of it. He knows the exact prescription. And the best thing about our Dr. Jesus, he pays the bill. He pays the bill. You see... That's why he would tell the Pharisees in this very same night. It's Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. You'll see it on the screen. Matthew 9, 13, he tells them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to see sick people. Gang, we do well to see people the way that Jesus sees them. Not as problems, but as patients. Something else happens here. There's another group. Take a look, if you would, at verse 18. There's another group that's there. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Now, the first group were the Pharisees and the scribes. That's one group. <laughs> they, they wanted to bring Jesus down. But this is a different group. And we're going to see that. These are the Pharisees and the disciples of John. And they're fasting. Like they're seeking God, okay? Then they came and said to him, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? I've already mentioned this is a different group. They paired up with John the Baptist's disciples. So they're honest seekers of God, and their approach is much different. They don't go to the disciples to sow seeds of discord. This group at the dinner, they go, and they go straight to Jesus. And I believe... They are legitimately asking Jesus a question because they're confused. They don't understand what's going on with Jesus. And let me explain why. Jesus and John the Baptist were very different. John the Baptist was a very austere man. From the way that he dressed, from what he ate. I mean, anyone that has locusts and honey as a diet, like, come on, add some vegetables, right? <laughs> 
He was a very austere man. From the way that he behaved, you brood of vipers, repent. I mean, that just was not Jesus' style. That's Old Testament style. And at this point in the ministry of Jesus, guess where John is? In jail. John sends a message to Jesus in Matthew 11. He's struggling. And he says, Jesus, are you the one or not? So if John is struggling, you've got to believe that his disciples are struggling. And so the disciples, they, they show up to Jesus and they ask him this question at the party because Jesus is not like John. He's at a party. John never would have gone to a party with sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus is calling himself the Messiah. I mean, we're a little bit confused here. And John's disciples and these Pharisees, they were fasting. They followed the tradition of the elders. Do you remember when the Pharisee was comparing himself to the tax collector? And in Luke chapter 18, verse 12, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. They did. They fasted every Tuesday and every Thursday. And so here they see Jesus at a party, and they're hungry. They've been fasting all day, and they see Jesus eating. They see Jesus enjoying. They see Jesus having fun. And John, he was an Old Testament prophet. In fact, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. In Matthew 11 to 13, Jesus makes it clear. All the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So his his ministry was not about enjoying life. His ministry was about reforming Israel. So Jesus had to show a different way. So I want you to see what Jesus responds. He responds with a very legitimate answer in verse 19. So Jesus said to him, Can the friends of the bridegroom, now that's an important word, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. You see, we know that they approached him sincerely because Jesus answers them very clearly. He doesn't answer them with a parable. He answers them very clearly. And John the Baptist's disciples get it. Because John the Baptist was the first to call Jesus the bridegroom. In John chapter 3, verse 29, John says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's speaking of Jesus. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John the Baptist called Jesus the bridegroom. So Jesus is speaking directly to John the Baptist's disciples. They get it. They understand. They make the connection that Jesus is affirming that he is who John the Baptist said he was. But he's different. And out for dinner with Jesus, we begin to see our Savior, who we follow, that he's a joyful groom. I do weddings all the time. All the time. And when I go to the groom, and I pray with him right before the wedding, he always looks at me and goes, I don't want to do this. I don't even like her. (laughs) I mean, she's not even pretty. I don't know why I'm doing this. Her mother made me. It's ridiculous. Are you kidding me? He's like this. When's the wedding? Oh. When do, when do, do I look? Do I not look? Like, what do I do? <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I go, dude, don't lock your knees. Just don't lock your knees. Just move. Be fluid. I can't wait to see her. And I'm praying with her. And, I, and when my hand is on his shoulder, he's like this. He is not miserable. He is joyful. And what Jesus is telling the disciples of John the Baptist, when you're with Jesus, there's joy. You see, John's disciples couldn't understand why he's so happy at this party. Because religion should be strict. Religion should be straight-laced. Religion should be stringent. I mean, when we come to church, don't talk when you walk into the sanctuary. It's holy. What's holy is when you grab someone and hug them and love them and talk as loud as you can. Well, when when you sit in church, you got to sit like this. I remember my mom, when we were sitting in church, we went to a denominational church, and if I was ever slouched down like this, she would put her elbow in my, right here, in my shoulder pocket and go, because this is how you sit at church. 
I mean, everyone holy sits like this. And when you worship, <laughs> you raise your hand at about 45 degrees and they go out like this. This is the holy look. Now, if you want to move, you sway like this. This says you're really holy. This, <laughs> you are out of control. That is not holy. What is it about Christians? We should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. We got Jesus. Now, if you got religion, I can understand why you are so strict and straight-laced and stringent. But if you've got a relationship with Jesus, there'll be nothing but inexpressible joy. Then he says something else to them. He says this. Would you take a look at verse... Uh, verse 20, 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts, the wineskins, the wine is spilled, the wineskins are ruined, but the new wine must be put into new wineskins. Let me explain what Jesus is saying. They had made Judaism such a burden to bear. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, you bind heavy burdens hard to bear on people, but you yourself are not willing to bear it. That's what they had made religion. But the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. Life with Jesus is joyful. It's not miserable. And when you choose to take on that joy, let me tell you what happens. Jesus tells us. When you're out for dinner with Jesus, we begin to see our Savior. He's going to do something new in your life. There's nothing like new clothes. New clothes feel good, right? In fact, when you're depressed, where do you go? The mall. You want to buy new shoes or a new shirt. Something about new clothes make you feel good. My son just had homecoming. You know what he bought? A new suit. Actually, he didn't buy it. I did. <laughs> You should have seen him in his new suit with his little gal. <laughs> he had his new little brown suit on, okay, new hair, the whole new thing. New feels good. And this group is looking at Jesus, John the Baptist and the Pharisees. They're looking at Jesus, and they like this new thing. And they would like to add this new thing to their old thing. So let's just kind of combine the two. But Jesus is making it very clear, you can't combine these two. Let me explain why. The new cloth... And the new wine are too powerful to put on the old stuff or to put in the old wineskins. The new cloth is so strong, it's going to tear the other cloth when you wash it. It's just so strong. And the new wine is so strong, when you put it into an old bag, it's going to bust the old bag. Church, you got to see the picture here of what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying this. He's already told them there's going to be a day when they're going to need to fast. And he's prepping them for his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And his resurrection, he's going to do a totally new thing in you by the power of his Holy Spirit. He's introducing the power of the Holy Spirit, the new cloth and the new wine. In fact, the Spirit reminds us, behold, I make all things new. Church, you can't mix your history, your religion, or your way of life with Jesus. He won't accept it. He wants to do a totally new thing in you. Church, maybe today you're known as Levi, but he wants to change your name to Matthew. And I don't know where you are today, but he does want to do something new in your life. All you have to do is answer when he calls and he says, follow me. Are you ready? Because here at the dinner table, we came to know Jesus. And we came to know he's a healing physician. We came to know he's a joyful groom. And we came to know his desire is to make even your life new. He can take who you are now and make you into something new. It's just what he does. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for your great grace. Oh, how good and great you are. And my prayer, Lord, is that you would move by your spirit 
and that you would do a great work this morning. Oh, Father, grant us changed lives. Church, would you be in prayer? Jesus makes all things new. He saw Levi, the sinner. He actually saw a savior. He saw Levi, who the tax who the Pharisees thought was a problem. Jesus just looked at him as a patient. I'm going to make Matthew new. He wants to make you new. He says, follow me. And Matthew got up out of his tax collector chair and he walked forward publicly with Jesus. He didn't care what Simon thought. He didn't care what James thought. He cared what Jesus thought about him. Jesus saw him as a sinner that needed a Savior. And if you're here today, and today's your day, Jesus has been pursuing you, your neighbor has brought you, even the 8.30 service. Today's your day to get up out of your seat and to follow Jesus, leaving everything behind like Matthew, and follow him. Pastor Pat's going to join me here at the pulpit. Gannon's going to raise a song for us. Church, would you be in prayer and in song? And if that's you and you want your life to be made new, get up out of your seat just like Matthew. You come forward. We're in prayer for you now. Church, be in prayer. Gannon, would you lead us in a song? It's real. And we're so thankful that today you want to make a decision to be made new. And so our church is going to pray with you. And I want to lead you in a prayer. And I know these are my words, but I want it to be your heart to Jesus. Because when Matthew decided to follow, he even gave his life. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus. I want my life to be made new. Amen. Come forward. Yeah, we'll wait for you. Thank you, Jesus, for your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And thank you for loving me. I believe in you. Please make my life new. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we would just like to pray with you for just a moment. Pastor Pat is right here. There's some prayer, a prayer team in the back. You'll be back with your friends in just literally a couple of moments. Would you go with Pastor Pat and just pray with them? Church, would you applaud them as they go? Hey, Calvary Chapel, here at South Bay, we memorize scripture. A little easier today, Romans chapter 14, but a reminder all week, verse 17, say it with me. For the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Challenge to change this week. Take a look at the screen. Look at the world with the eyes of Jesus and find someone who needs healing. I guarantee you got someone. God bless you guys. I'll see you out in the lobby.